Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day. And Lord, we ask that you be with Sujay um, and uh, allow your healing hand to rest on him. Uh, that your grace be sufficient for him in this time and that you heal him of his head injury um, and that he be okay. Be with his family and comfort them as well. And Lord, in this time as we begin to uh, lift your word even higher, I ask that either because of me or in spite of me that you bring a message to your people this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So again, it is Memorial Day weekend, and what do we often think of when it comes to Memorial Day weekend? Barbecuing? <laughs> Hamburgers, hot dogs, maybe some baseball, maybe going swimming since pools are going to be starting to open tomorrow and everything, but uh, it's so much more than that, isn't it? I had the blessing and opportunity yesterday to participate with uh, Nathan's scout troop, uh, as we went to a church up in the North County and placed flags um, on, the, on the grave sites of people that had served, both men and women. Um, it was pretty amazing. One of the graves that we went to was a veteran from the War of 1812. Uh, so some of them went back uh, pretty far. It was pretty neat. And then I was talking uh, to Kim, and she said she went to Antietam yesterday, uh, and they placed roses on the graves of soldiers from the Battle of Antietam at the graveside there. Um, so Memorial Day is so much more than just barbecuing, isn't it? It's remembering the sacrifices that were made by those um, men and women who have served uh, for the freedom and the safety of others. And that's such an important thing to remember over the course of this weekend as well. A um, couple good movies I'll suggest. I wouldn't say with uh, your kids necessarily, but they're really good Memorial Day movies. Uh, Saving Private Ryan is always one of my favorites. Um, and the other one, if you haven't seen it yet, it's a newer movie, Hacksaw Ridge. Um, pretty incredible stuff. Um, and it's a true story about Private Desmond Doss. Um, and I learned this after watching the movie and went back through my Medal of Honor winner's book and took a look. Uh, he never raised an arm. Um, he never raised a weapon at all. It was against his religious beliefs. So he actually went into combat in World War II in the Pacific Theater, never holding a gun, uh, just serving as a medic, uh, and went through several campaigns uh, and um, did some heroic stuff. I won't give the movie away. I'll let you watch it. Uh, but it's a really good movie, especially for Memorial Day, to just remember some of the sacrifices that have been made. Um, but today, in the life of the church, is an incredibly important day of remembrance that, just like sometimes we forget about the importance of Memorial Day, we also neglect and forget about the importance of today being Ascension Sunday. When we think of core times in the church, what are some of the core times we think of? Jesus' birth, Christmas, correct? The crucifixion, Good Friday, resurrection, Easter Sunday, ascension is in there too, Pentecost, the birth of the church and the gift of the Holy Spirit, and then Christ's return, correct? Even in the Apostles' Creed, if we take a look at that, when it talks about Jesus, what does it say? says, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. When is that? Christmas, right? Suffered under Pont Pontius Pilate, was crucified, Good Friday, dead and buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead, Easter. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and he will come again. He will come again. Excellent. So these are some of the really important times in the church. But do we always think of ascension in the same way we think of Christmas or Good Friday or Easter or even the remembrance that Jesus will come again? Let's take a look at the uh, passage from Acts again today. Barry, could we bring that up?
One of the great things about this book, it was written by the author of Luke, um, who was a physician and a friend of Paul's on the journey, who set out to write an account of everything that took place. And Acts begins as sort of a recap of everything that he talked about in the book of Luke, but it really lays out what took place on Ascension Sunday. So he's sharing... He tells Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over the course of 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Lord. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? We talked about this before, that... A lot of people saw Jesus as coming to restore Jerusalem, to put the king head back in Jerusalem. But what does Jesus say to them? He replied, "It it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. See, the disciples were thinking that this was the time, that it wasn't just Jesus ascending, but this is the time that Jesus was finally going to call everything down and reestablish the rule there in Jerusalem. But what Jesus was saying is there's something more about this life. There's something more in God's plan. And to help you with this, you're going to get the gift of the Holy Spirit. And you're going to take the message, not just to Jerusalem, but to all the world, to uh, going out into every direction. Can you go back one slide for me? Thank you. Uh, In Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So this was Jesus' plan for them through the ascension. Um, Sorry, I lost my train of thought for a moment. Let me go back to my notes. So, why is the ascension so important? The transformation of the disciples that takes place during the 40 days following Easter is what makes the transformation such a huge thing with this, with, in the ascension. It's sort of the final piece of what Jesus is doing to prepare them. Their experience of the ascension was much different from their experience of the crucifixion. When we think of the disciples... You know, the ascension must have been very different. This is the time that Jesus is rising up and going back into heaven. What was their previous experience of Jesus leaving? Dying on a cross, right? This elicited fear in them because they didn't know. They were insecure. They didn't know what was going to happen to them after the fact. But in this, Jesus is being raised up in a cloud. Jesus has taken the last 40 days since Easter to talk to them about the kingdom of God, to prove to them that he has been raised and that death has been conquered and that God has significant plans for each and every one of them in the life of the church. This may explain explain the transformation that prepared the disciples for their ministry ahead. Because they weren't just people hiding anymore. They were people that had a boldness about them. When I think about Jesus and his disciples and this culminating piece, it drew me back to a leadership training class that I had when I was in boot camp in the Coast Guard. And it was a fairly simple training program. Basically, it had four parts. I do, you watch. I do, you do it with me, you do, I watch, you do, and we both go and train someone else in what we do. Does that make sense? So if you really take a look at Jesus' life and ministry, both before crucifixion and even afterwards during the 40 days after Easter, 
You have Jesus teaching. You have Jesus preparing. You have Jesus doing, but you also have Jesus sending the disciples to go do things on their own, going into villages to heal, to cast out demons, to uh, do all the work that he was doing. But now we're getting to the final piece that you do and we both go forth. That's what's taking place in the assumption. Uh, in the ascension. It's the final piece of that leadership training, that discipleship training that Jesus is doing with the disciples. He's preparing them to go forth, and he's letting them know that I've given you all that I can give you. I've trained you in everything that I could train you. I've prepared you in every way that I could prepare you. It's now time for you to go forth and do it. It's time for you to go into all the world and share the message. It's time for you to be my witnesses. See, the ascension prepares them to understand more fully Christ's role and their role in the mission to come. No more fishing for these disciples. No more fear of authorities. No more hiding. What must that experience have been like for them to cause such a drastic change? Could you imagine watching Jesus just being lifted into the clouds. Such an incredible thing. This is where doubt ended for the disciples. This is where the kingdom of God became greater than any earthly notion of kingdom. This is where fear and death ended and bold faith began. Jesus came from God and through ascension returns to God. Jesus goes from earthly presence to our heavenly advocate, to our intercessor, and to being the head of the church. While he is one with God, he is taken up to heaven, retaining his human form so that he will one day return to his home on earth with us, the other promise in the ascension. Through Christ, we are reminded that we also come from God and will return to God in whom we live move, and have our being. This is where hope and grace and the atonement come in. See, the ascension is about the journey of the disciples and about the culmination of that to where they then go forth without Jesus with them to continue this mission. Why do we know that they did that? Why do we even know that it was successful we know because every single one of us sitting in this room are here because they did their job. They did what they were supposed to do. They continued the mission. They continued the witness. They continued being the disciples and disciple makers that Jesus had made them to be. Jesus spent time with them. He taught them. He prepared them. But in the last piece of the leadership training, he sent them forth to then be the trainers of others to prepare witnesses to prepare disciples, and we are the product of that. That is where we come in and that we continue that journey as well. But how do we do that? See, our challenge, just like the disciples' challenge, is to remain centered in God and to seek the wisdom and teaching of the Holy Spirit. Remember, in the end, he said that he was sending the gift of the Holy Spirit that would come at Pentecost, and we'll talk about that more next week, right? But we need to be seeking out that gift of the Holy Spirit for us. It's not just a story that we read, and it's not just about people that we're disconnected with, but it's a story that's for each and every one of us. We need to be seeking and experiencing the gift of the Holy Spirit, because that is what guides us forth. That is what gives us our witness. That is what gives us the opportunity to share and to disciple and to make disciples of other people as well. One of the questions I ask every time I take a mission team out is, where did you experience God today? Maybe that's a question we need to ask ourselves each and every day. Because maybe some of us are saying, I don't know that I've ever experienced the Holy Spirit. I don't know that I've ever even looked for the Holy Spirit. Part of it is 
looking for that opportunity to experience what God is trying to say and do in our lives. How is God moving us? How is God touching us? How is God teaching us? How is God guiding us? These are important things. But it's, also, it's awesome on mission trips to hear the testimonies of people that begin to share where they saw God in the midst of their work during the day. Where they saw God in the midst of their serving and mission. Maybe God will bless each and every one of us if we're looking on a daily basis to seeing where God is meeting us and where God is guiding us each and every day. The Holy Spirit was given as a gift to stubborn, hard-headed, mistake-making disciples just like us, giving them the strength to speak truth to power and spread the good news of Christ to the ends of the earth. The same is true for us, right? See, our faith is not about others doing it for us because we think they are better or more qualified than us. How often do we get into that? That's for those people to do. They went to seminary. That's for those people to do. They pray better. That's for those people to do. They teach better. That's for those people to do. They like kids. That's for those people, you know, things like that where we think other people are better at doing things than we are and we put ourselves down and don't recognize that God uses imperfect, stubborn, hard-headed, mistake-making people. It's about us trusting in God and taking the authority given to us as those adopted by God's grace and filled with the Holy Spirit to carry on the mission we are called to. I had the opportunity on the confirmation retreat to talk to the youth about being adopted by God. A great story for that. How many of you have read the uh, Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis? Anybody? Favorite stories. One of the things that always stumped me in that story is how the kids that show up in Narnia could all of a sudden all be kings and queens of Narnia. When you think of a kingdom, you only have one king, one queen, correct? But in this, in this story, in this book, every kid that shows up in Narnia becomes a king or a queen of Narnia. And part of it is, in scripture, it talks about that we are adopted by God as his sons and his daughters. So Jesus becomes our brothers. And since he's the king, he's been given all rule and everything else. We are adopted by God. We become part of God's children. So that's where kings and queens come from. So figure that out for C.S. Lewis. Hopefully that helps you figure that out for that story too. Um, so <laughs> won't hang you guys up as well. But um, we are adopted by God. God carry, cares about us, and he sends us forth in a mission. And because we're God's children, we do have something to share. We have gifts and graces that we can offer that no one else can in the same way because God is using us for something special to be his witnesses, not just to our local church, but to the world, to everyone that we encounter. You see, our mission on earth is not merely a human endeavor. It's a concert with the divine that guides and directs our steps. Through this comes healing, blessing, love, and hope for the world. Last week at Sujay's baptism, one of the things a lot of the youth enjoyed doing while we were getting set up was taking rocks and skipping them. Uh, how many of you like skipping rocks? I love skipping rocks. Where they're taking the rocks and skipping them, and sometimes they grab big rocks and just throw them out, and boom, and then you get the ripples going across. And one of the things I love to talk to the youth about are ripples. See, the impact we make has a ripple effect, correct? The impact that we make on the earth, on the world, on the lives of other people has a ripple effect. When we go forth and we do things for God, we have a ripple effect effect that we create because it's not just that one thing that we do but it's what happens with it from there remember that whole leadership training i do you watch i do you do with me you do i watch okay it's about creating those ripples what happens at the end when you send the person forth to go train other people they train someone who trains someone else who trains someone else how many people did jesus start with 
12. 12. We have more than 12 people in this room. <laughs> Think of how many churches there are, not just in the United States or not even just in this community, but around the world that began because 12 people went out as witnesses and shared the good news with other people so that their lives could be changed too, but also trained them so that they could go forth and share that good news with others and keep it spreading, the ripples growing. You're a rock ready to be tossed into the lake. God wants to use you to create great ripples. What you do in the lives of other people, maybe it's just your children, maybe it's your neighbor, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's someone that God has laid on your heart to intentionally share faith with, you're going to do something in their lives, and because of what you've done in their lives, they are going to take that forth and impact someone else's life, and that is going to continue down the road. Memorial Day weekend, we remember the sacrifices that were made by others so that freedom could be had, so that lives could be saved, correct? That has a ripple effect. That has people that honor what, was, what happened and what they did through their lives. If you watch the end of Saving Private Ryan, that's what it's all about. The soldier that was saved by the men who sacrificed their lives for him is at the gravestones of these men asking his wife, have I been a good man? Have I lived a good life? Because he wanted to honor what they had done. This is what we do when we make disciples. This is what we, we do when we're witnesses for God. This is the impact that Ascension Sunday had on the disciples. And that's why it has such an impact on us. So in closing, as we remember this Memorial Day weekend, what others have done for us, let us include in that a remembrance and celebration of what Christ has done for us and the example of the disciples who began the witness of Jesus that continues through us today. Take time to look up today. Remember in the scripture, it talked about the disciples after Jesus rising up, that they were just, look it up. Could you imagine? <laughs> okay, he's rising up in a cloud. You know, I could imagine that. I think I would be doing the same thing. I, mouth dropped, eyes up in the air. Just looking at what's going on, and then the, the two guys show up in white robes saying, why are you looking up? You got other things to do. It's pretty cool stuff. But today, just like those disciples, take time to look up and remember that Christ ascended into heaven and know that we have assurance that he will come again. Seek the presence of God today through the Holy Spirit and let it fill you and guide you for the wonderful work that God has in store for you and for us as Epworth. It is through this that we take our place as witnesses to the majesty, love, and grace of God, which has, does, and will continue to transform the world until the day that Christ returns. Be his witness. Amen.